right-handed mind on the table. Let me explain. But before I do, I need to disclose that no one died or was injured in the making of the speech. <laughs> on a typical day where I was happily playing solitaire and checking out Facebook at work, I got the call. June 6th, the anniversary of D-Day. Not World War II, Displacement Day. The day my 23-year job was eliminated. Just like that, it was all over. Hard work, tenure, and skills had nothing to do with this cost-cutting decision. Is it curious that my first thought wasn't to call my wife, but that I had to find a new Toastmasters club? <laughs> on my ride to work on that fateful day, a news report announced 175,000 new jobs in the U.S. making the unemployment rate 7.6%. On my ride home, I was on the other side, one of the 11.7 million unemployed. To grasp the magnitude, take the entire population of New York City and add 4 million people. The call was like a shot to the head. I was being put to rest and people were preparing for my funeral. Condolences rolled in, hugs happened, tears flowed. How will people see you? An old manager once asked if I ran through a wall, would people follow? At the time, I didn't know the answer. I needed to know the answer. That was a lifeline, a call to action. Fast forward six years later. I don't recall what we're coming in. A day of self-reflection, a chance to hover over my dead body and ask, was my life a career success? The notes flooded in. Tom, you touched me. Personally and professionally, more than you'll ever know. Tom, we love you. This is your next speech. I ran through the wall, and people followed. But how was I going to tell my three daughters that dad was being sent to the farm just like his childhood dog? The spending freeze on shoes, clothes, and pizzas worse than death to teenagers. My middle child's head tilted at a mortar's angle as a tear slowly rolled down her cheek as if to fall on my casket. My youngest held me as if I was in my bear hug as if it was the last time ever. My social media conscious 16 year old told me that all responses to the relocation question on Facebook was no, as if I had a choice. The denial, the anger, the acceptance, the exhaustive feeling of having my family watch my own demise. But my support system refused to let the last nail go into the coffin as they put in a crowbar made of emails, phone calls, and leads. I was being resuscitated. How many of you have a will prepared? A will reduces stress and chaos. The run through the wall question six years earlier had been my wake up call. I didn't realize how it would prevent my professional passing. My eyes were wide open as I built an extraordinary career-saving and life-changing network. In Keith Brazzi's book, Never Eat Alone, he notes, build it before you need it. Real relationships built over the years provided me meaning and are the reason for my success. I wasn't six feet under. I was six degrees from Kevin Bacon. <laughs> or at least my next big lead. I was a flat I was alive and my support system was my CPR. My job loss was a celebration of life, not a funeral. It reminded me how deep my love and appreciation really are for my family, friends, and network. I wasn't defined by my job. I defined my own life and was going to do my funeral my way. No, I'm not going to belt out Sinatra. I lost my job. I use my displacement as a reaffirmation that when I leave this earth, I'm leaving with no regret. Think about your own family. When your spirit's hovering over the mourners, did you give them something to mourn about? That didn't come out right. <coughs> so let's go back to the original question. Have you ever imagined your own view? Who will do your eulogy? Who will be your pallbearers? Who will attend or even care? My eulogy was shouted out by the many 
key people in my network who blew my trumpet with humbling accounts of who I was and had become. My pallbearers carried me when I couldn't go any further. The overwhelming flood of notes and messages showed who cared. I have to admit, I started writing the speech immediately after I lost my job. It wasn't overcome. Just a belief that I'm surrounded by an ironclad network that refused to stop giving me oxygen. Who has ever sat through 
something like this where they actually all they did was read. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, it happens. <coughs> so you can be amongst the masses and do the same thing. Yeah. Or you can be a little bit different. And it's not being whacked out of your mind, it's being different enough that people will remember who you are, remember your message, remember your content, fiction <coughs> or non-fiction. All of us believe we have a message in our book somewhere that we want to share. All we want to do is that, get that message out to as many people as we possibly can. But that's the written work. Some of the greatest books in the world have never been read. Because it's about marketing. I am a terrible salesperson in marketing. Which sales and marketing people will tell you to never start off with that statement. But that's reality. I don't like pushing things on people. However, what I do like is sharing my message and content with others, and I can sell them. I'm okay with that, because I believe in my message, and as authors, I believe you do as well. So if you sell your message and your content, there are, there are a variety of ways to do it. And by starting with an open, I'm not reading from my book speech, seven minutes, that speech is six and a half to seven minutes, it may or may not work for you. However, my suggestion for you is to have an open forum that people get to know who you are, the content and the message of your book, without going to the pages. Because now they get a little taste of who you are. They get a little taste of who you are as a speaker, and as a writer, and as a person with a simple message. How many of you have an elevator speech written? How many of you have know what an elevator speech is? We'll start there. <laughs> an elevator speech is how long? One minute, five minutes, 27 minutes, I don't know. It's however long you have to send a message without warning someone. However, there are times where you, I've been on, literally on an elevator and <laughs> have talked to CEOs who I needed to get my message across in three floors. So you need, to, you need a, an elevator speech. My suggestion for you is if you take nothing more out of today, is have an elevator speech that is a minute, three, maybe five, and if you're really ambitious, ten. And then put it to memory. And that's going to change over time, by the way. If you write a new book, you're going to update it. But people need to get to know who you are and only the way that you can do this. And by the way, in someone who introduces you, write your own introduction. Do not let anyone do your own introduction for you. The ones that I read this morning, I didn't write. And there's a reason for that, and I'm okay with that as the speaker. I'm okay because they get to tell me what they want to say about themselves. There's no repetitive information that's in there. They're not going to cover things that I've already covered. And they get to say some things in one way and then can come back out in their elevator speech that says it in a different way. And they can share other pieces of information. So maybe my introduction, someone says, hey, he's written five books. His most recent one is The Unofficial Guide to Fatherhood. I don't have to come out and say that. Now I can just simply say what I want to say and get involved in the topic on that hand. Yes? Just to affirm what you're saying, in a totally different experience, I, I, was, uh, I had my book on the Names Project AIDS quilt, and I... And, and, and so 207 called and said that they would do an interview on 207, and we think, oh, great. He, and then, so, so there's a, there, you know, there, people are getting better, so what's the relevance of the quilt? And I just about died. So, um, given the questions, not only the introduction, but, you know, because they're not necessarily with you, you know? So give them a list. So give them, yeah, tell you, tell you what the introduction is, and also when you're going for interviews, give them the questions you want them to ask you so that you can come off, you know, in a good light. So as, as authors, there's a, there's a lot of things going on in our concentration is on book readings, but if you are dealing with media, uh, radio, TV, interviews, and if you're not, I'd say it right about now, create a media page and know this is not a solicitation, but if you go to my website, transformationcom.com, and if you can't remember that, grab a bookmark from me over in the other room, uh, go ahead and check out my media page. 
Someone suggested that after I've already written three books, why not? Someone can go in and look at the media page. There's copies and links of shows I've already given because they like to be marketed as well. And there's a list of questions depending on the topic or depending on the book itself. And my introduction, my bio is there. My bio gets updated as I update it. I update my website. But the bio and the introduction needs to be your way with the expectation to the introducer of do not deviate, please do not deviate, read verbatim. And someone will say, oh, of course. But you get someone who might want to wing it, you're going to bring them back to reality, which is saying all I ask is that you read this verbatim. And now you know how long it is. They're not going to take any, much, any more of your time. It's already been measured out. And there's a lot of good benefits to it. So the introduction when it comes to a book reading is just as important. And I know I didn't give one here today. But it's just as important as setting the tone for what's going to happen in the rest of the day. So I would give this speech in a book reading. You can, when you have your elevator speech, you may not be comfortable in sharing this full-blown story with someone or an introductory part of your book or a chapter if you don't have the ability, capabilities, desire to want to do that, that's okay. You should have at a minimum a desire to get an elevator speech of a minute to three to get let someone feel who you are before you put your nose into a book. They need to figure out who you are because they're here to see you. They're here to listen about your book, whether it's curiosity. It could even be work. I've had a lot of people show up and say, I saw it in the paper. I don't even know what this thing's about. We'll give it just to give them something for them to walk away with and be excited about. I'm going to share a couple of, at least a couple. We're going to talk about what we liked and what we didn't like about these. And we'll start with the first one. And they're all from Book TV. And the subject matter of the book is not relevant. The how famous the author isn't really even relevant in, as we go through. So what you're looking for is what you like and what you didn't like. And this is specifically, this one is from Book TV. We'll just see a little bit of a snippet, about three minutes of it. It's been my very great pleasure to uh, introduce our speaker several times in the past, but more importantly, to read some of the seminal work he has done. He is the author, among many other things, of Lucy Grant. Co-author of The Bell Curve, author of In Pursuit of Happiness. I, I wish I could tell you you could buy all of those and more at our bookstore, but uh, I have had our bookstore's inventory of Dr. Murray's books. I took one copy of Achieving Happiness. Uh, no, I'm sorry. I always got a human accomplishment. Uh, there's one left out there. Uh, the National Journal has ranked him as one of 150 people who make a difference in policy making in this country. Uh, sometimes I know he feels like he is tilting at windmills, but I can't imagine a better Don Quixote. His topic today, talking about tilting at windmills, too many kids are going to college. Here to tell you why, Dr. Charles Murray. Thank you very much. Um, what I'm going to do today is talk So that is just the introduction to a book sign. What did you like about it? Yeah, he's excited about the author. He had a sense of humor. It was funny. There was a little bit of a sense of humor. He did his own book. Hey, what's that? He did his own book. He did do his homework. Short. Sure. It was short. It was only a minute, which is good. Do you think, who wrote that introduction? Do you think it was the introducer or do you think it was the author? My guess would be the introducer. So the author is sitting there. So what do you think of the author's reaction as he's going through this? Uh, yeah, we, we think he was drinking. I will tell you, 
whether it's one time or a thousand times, your excitement for it needs to be the same, or don't be. And, I, and this guy might be extremely famous if he is. Uh, sorry. Uh, but, and I'm sure, and, and I did not watch the rest of this. He could have been phenomenal, but I looked at it purely from the introductory piece, and I was, I was really intrigued with his reaction to the introduction, or lack of reaction to the introduction. He was just kind of, eh. And there was another point back? I do. Two points. I thought the introducer obviously was comfortable speaking. And even though he did slip up, it didn't seem to. He just said, oh, well, and he went right on to the next thing. Um, because we do make mistakes when we speak. And it's good to be able to rebound from that and not let it destroy what is coming ahead. I also felt like when he said doctor such and such, word, it, he really did uh, remind me of a professor. And sometimes I think they have that kind of looking around. You know, he wasn't as vested there, but I thought the speaker who introduced him was fine. The way if he messed up, he didn't seem to rattle him. Yeah, it seemed very academic. And yeah. You see on book TV a lot of them are more right. the academic version of it. And a lot of people in this room may have some fiction that's out there. I have some business books, so I kind of get this feel of in between. Uh, it may have been a little bit more academic, so we take that with a grain of salt. Uh, the person was, uh, the introducer was obviously very passionate about the author. I, I'm also very cautious as someone who teaches public speaking uh, on being too judgmental of the introducer because they might be nervous because, or excited because maybe you're a hero of them of there. Uh, so you take it with a grain of salt, their introduction, you're handing them something to read verbatim, and if all they read, if all, if all they remember is the introducer and not you, you've got a bigger problem with your book reading than, than that. So you, we just have to be cautious with it. He did make some mistakes. But here's some points by not writing his own introduction. There was mentions about the book of, hey, I just halved your inventory, and are we selling books? Are we not selling books? Are books available? So now the audience, the audience is kind of leaving with questions, saying, what's going on here? And he may have come back later in the presentation and mentioned something like that. But it is a book reading, and we want to bring it back to the book. And I thought there were a couple pieces that were lacking in the introduction itself. Yes? It's also a little bit unfortunate that his final line is that he's tilting at windmills and presumably he's written this book, you know, because he has a serious concern and it goes back to your point of, you know, what, what do you want the, your self-portrait to be before you step up and start speaking? Yeah. And as a speaker, he's gonna overcome it, but. as the author, he looks very comfortable in walking up to a lectern. So he's done this before. So he, I'm sure he can recover himself. But there have been times where I've been introduced prior to me writing my own introductions, and I was thrown. And you're thrown up, no, no, you've got my wrong title. You <laughs> mispronounced my name. You. In a speech contest, they gave the wrong title of the speech I was given, and I'm like, what? I just, what's happening? But now, my mind's going, what's happening? What's going on? What's ha how do I recover? Versus concentrating on what's more important, you, the audience, and that's what it's all about. So we're going to go to the second one. Thanks so much for having me today. It's always a pleasure uh, to come back to your where I spent 12 very happy years, beginning as a copy player in the fall of 1982. Um, the Times Square of today is not exactly like the Times Square where I went to work, and that's uh, mostly a good thing, I think, because sometimes I was afraid to go out and buy the daily news at midnight. But um, I hope you'll forgive my very intrusiveness. First of all, as you know from the movies, it's how we journalists tend to work. Secondly, I run hot, and this room seems warm to me, although it's very cold outside today, so it probably feels good to everyone else. Um, I'd like to take just a moment, if I could. I don't want to make extensive remarks because I'm interested in hearing your questions and there's so much in the news about Iraq today that I think that would be the most constructive thing. But to take just a moment to describe a little bit about what this book aims to do and how it came about. Over the years, um, the Times has published books growing out of news events, but they've often been compilation books uh, in which the previously published dispatches of the paper have simply been strung together with some connecting material. After the September 11th attacks, the Times had the notion to assign my colleague Richard Bernstein, then a book critic and now the Berlin Bureau chief, to write a narrative from scratch about the rise of Islamic fundamentalism, the attacks on the trade center, the lives of the victims, and how all those stories came together on that awful September morning. And the book was very well 
received a, a, a modest financial success, so the paper thought it should try to replicate that with a book about the war. And I was serving last winter as a correspondent in the Times Washington Bureau, to which I returned on, on September 11, 2001. It was my first day back after five wonderful years in California. It wasn't planned that way, it just turned out to be that way. In any case, um, I took on this assignment, but I was an unlikely candidate to do it. I spent about a year covering the State Department, but I've never been to Iraq, and sadly, I still haven't been to Iraq. I never covered the military. I wasn't an embedded reporter, but I spent about 20 years of my life working at the paper, and um, I had the chance to write what was a sort of second rough draft of history of how this war came together, how it was prosecuted and fought, and how it's going in the aftermath, which we all know is still all too with us. Um, as I said, we journalists tend to be used to writing the first rough draft of history for daily publication. This was a strange um, exercise for me in which I had about just under four months to produce about 105, 110,000 words at the rate of about 8,000 words a week, starting on May 1st. And I did this by consulting our own published coverage, the coverage of other newspapers like the Washington Post and the Los Angeles Times, doing what interviews I could manage to do with senior American, British, French, United Nations officials to piece together. What's that? Teaching people how to do resumes, interviewing, 
networking, and yet I'm off looking for a job. I've got a real credibility problem. I'm <laughs> going to job seeking groups and networking groups. But by getting to the point and not apologizing that I don't have a job, we just got directly into the content and actually had a deeper conversation. They're the ones who actually wrote the book. I didn't know they did. Because of those conversations we had. But I, I imagine myself going back saying, do I apologize for saying, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm trying to teach you how to find one, but I don't have one myself. So we beat that dead horse on apologizing and, and don't. But you know, what are some other pieces about this introduction that you like? Okay, by saying he hasn't been in Iraq, it is real. And, and it's not an apology, it's just that I haven't been there. I'm great. Well, you know, one, one of the groups I belong to and go to conferences now and then is a newspaper journalist group. And, you know, I think depending on the audience that he was talking to, it might have, his speech might have been pretty appropriate. I mean, as I was listening to him, I was thinking if I were sitting at the conference I'm going to in a month from now, everybody would have been like this, you know, because they, they were all doing what he's doing. So the point, and the point that you're making is, he's got a very comfortable tone. Mm -hmm. He's speaking with the audience, not to the audience, and that's always really good as a speaker. He is also talking about a topic that is relevant, that is probably a unique take on it. Did you figure out what his unique take is yet? So I'm three minutes into a video, and I'm not sure what his book is yet, and there's nothing wrong with that, but here's an opportunity for you saying, as the writer of this book, here's how it differs from other books on Iran and Iraq and the Middle East, and how many books are there on Iran, Iraq, Syria, Libya, you know, what are the things that differentiate your book? Anyone ever watch Shark Tank? Yeah. How long do you have to sell your thing? Maybe 30 seconds, you actually lose your attention after 7 seconds when it comes to getting someone's first impression. So you don't have a whole lot of time, and if you're talking about, you know, I'm getting a little hot in here, and the temperature in the room, whatever it may be, if you're using that valuable time to make the first impression, you're going to take away a little bit of credibility and a little bit about what you're here for, and that's the credibility of the book that's in hand. So talk about how your book differs from anyone else. And by the way, if you have not figured out how your book differs from everyone else's, put that in your elevator speech, put it on paper, make sure that you know in three to five points why your book is so much different than anyone else's and make it obvious to everyone else that's out there. Public speaking accident. Tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you just told. It's an opportunity here on why your book differs from anyone else. And to the point of... They really had my attention because it's a really interesting topic. Same thing is, topic's not going away. They're already in the room. I don't have to sell you on the topic. Now let me tell you why I'm going to put a different spin on the discussion of Iraq than, I, than you've heard in the past or you've read in the paper or you've seen on CNN. Now do I have your attention? And that's the piece is grabbing people's attention. It's not about, there are some people that, you won't believe it, we've known each other for this long now. I am painfully shy and introverted, and I say that in the present tense. You don't have to be wild and jumping up and down in the aisles to grab somebody's attention. You just need words that can be conveyed verbally, not just on paper. We might all be great writers, but if we're not, even if we are great writers, we need to get that message across to someone in a verbal sense. I'm going to spend... 30 seconds trying to get this other one up, and if for some reason it doesn't work, we're going to keep moving on. Yeah, it's still up. That was nice. The other one is a book, Eric Stackelbeck, and if you get a chance to look it up, please do. S T A K D L B E C K. And he was on uh, Stackelbeck. S T A K E L. And he wrote a book called ISIS Exposed. So, interesting topic, very relevant, very present. And he came up and was talking to a group of about 20 people. An aha moment of, listen, there's only 10 to 20 people sitting in his room, and he's got a really interesting book. He's sitting in the middle of Washington, D.C., talking to politicians and a bunch of others. 
and if only 10 to 20 show up, I'm going to be okay. If only 10 to 20 show up, I'm like, okay, I'm okay with that. But he's starting to talk, and he thanked the organizers. And not one of those long, drawn-out, thank, thank you for having me, you are the greatest people ever, oh, I couldn't be doing anything without you. It became very engaging of, here's the organization that brought me here, here's the good that they do for this organization. And they're phenomenal, look them up. They're, they're really good at what they do. Thank you for having me here. And then he was very engaging, very funny, talking about ISIS and saying, you know, I'm talking about this topic about ISIS, and it's a very serious topic, and I have no one to tell except my wife, and I'm talking about murder and stabbing and shooting, and, and people are kind of laughing because he's making fun of the only person who, can, who he can tell is his wife, who says, stop talking about it. And it, it's really an, an engaging moment. And he's talking about a nice personal story that's not tied directly to the book, but has relevance to the book, and there's this relationship. And that's a little bit of what I was teaching with the, the seven-minute speech here. And I was prepared. An elevator speech does just as well of talking about the audience, who you are, and what you're trying to accomplish while you're telling the story about your book. So it's, it's this twisted way of saying, not only am I going to regurgitate what's in my book, I'm going to regurgitate in a way that is relevant, that has an engaging tone to it, and you're going to get excited about it on a very serious, sticky topic. You're going to say, I want to grab a copy of that book. And even if you write a nice, fun children's book, it's the same thing here. So if you want to make it sticky of telling a relevant story that might touch the hearts of a parent, a grandparent, someone who could buy the book. Is a book reading about book sales? a little bit, as an ancillary benefit. If that is your primary benefit of being there, you're probably in the wrong place. Because, and I've learned that the hard way, of showing up with boxes of books and hopes and of selling a bunch, I walk out with those same books and they're still heavy. <laughs> <laughs> but it's about the message to the audience. They'll buy their books when they're ready to buy their books. Or they'll browse and they'll say, I like an e-book, and they'll go to Amazon. And then you run to your author ranking on Amazon and you see you've got a little spike from one or two book sales. <laughs> <laughs> I do. <laughs> but it's not about the book sale. And I think you have to realize that as, as you go through this. So when it comes to setting up for a book signing, think about what you need to do. What are some of the things? So I say, I've got a book. Maybe it's the first or maybe it's the seventh, but I'm ready to do a book reading. Who do you call? What do you do? How do you promote? Oh, you want me to answer that for you? <laughs> there are libraries, there are Kiwanis, there are Lions, there are... If you can't find anyone to find you speak, go out and just look up Kiwanis Club, Lions, Rotary, and just talk to people. And not about the book sale, but about the message. And again, how does your book differ from other books that are out there? What is your message, your key message you want people to walk away with? You usually get 15 to 20 minutes with a Qantas group. And a lot of it might just be, talk to me about your writing process. Talk to me about what inspired you. And if you haven't been able to answer those questions, they're pretty typical. Put them as part of your elevator speech exercise and learning how to answer those confidently. And my books, when I get the question, and I have to actually ask the question, well, which book? Because I was inspired by different ways. And then I'll go into a different path, and they might ask me the same question in different book readings and book signings, and I'll answer it in different ways, because I might have multiple answers, and I'll just pick, I'll just pick from a different one in my head. Because you, want, you don't want to get to a point where you're just constantly saying the same stories over and over and over again, because you might have the same audience. Has anyone ever seen the My Funeral speech before? Okay, you, you came to it, I know you came. So I gave it as part of a public speaking piece, and I was a little concerned with that, and I looked around the audience and said, no, you're good. But you don't want to constantly repeat your same messages over either. And if you have started to develop a loyal following, and I know that Darcy has, Darcy has a loyal following of people who love her book and her series, she might have to change her stories up a little bit to represent herself in different ways on what inspired her or moved down a different path to something else that might kind of, have kind of inspired her secondary uh, piece of it. So if you go into the promotion, uh, 
it, we talked about the key word a little earlier, platform. How much is social media involved in setting up the promotion for a book signing or a book reading? It's big. It may not translate into sales. It may not even translate into someone being there. And it was really interesting because somebody said, I just heard on a statistic on Twitter. Anyone have a Twitter account? So I might have three extra followers at the end of this conversation. This is great. At Tom Dowd, by the way. Uh, feel free to follow. So for every hundred Twitter followers you have, if you sent a message, the chances of the number of people that have read that post that you put up, that you listed once, is one. One person. I got really concerned when I had this guy, and he didn't have a whole lot of followers, and he stopped following me. And I knew him enough to ask him why. Always be careful with the questions you ask that you don't want the answers to. But I asked him the question, and he said, you're sending too many posts. So many what? Posts. But I had too many messages on, on Twitter. And, and, and I thought of that in terms of interesting point. This is just my time to uh, let me know how much time. So the, he's, he says to me, you have too many followers. And I say, ah, gee, uh, I'm sorry. And then I, so I only post them once a day. And I didn't get a whole lot of response to it. And then I started to realize that I'm, I'm catering to him, but there's 45 other followers that are not reading my message because they're not part of the one. There might be 45 people who have read it that day. And so I started sending the same message out once in the morning, once in the afternoon, once at night. And I've got a greater response for it. Social media is not good for sales as far as, as I know. Social media is great for getting the message out for people who can attend your book signing. So go to Facebook. If you don't have a Facebook page for your business, for your book, you may want to think about it in addition to your personal one so people can see that side of you in a concentrated effort. Get a following. Send it out to them. Use emailing messages. But get the word out. And tell your loyal following, your loyal 10 best friends and family, to tell friends and family. And it's okay if you're filled with a room of friends and family to start with. Because they'll start telling other people, and they'll put it on their social media. So you want to continue to do it to get the message out. When you're doing a book signing and a book reading, it cannot be winging it. You cannot just get up and start to, to wing it. So I can have a strategy, but it, it's a formula that works for me. But I give the seven minute speech. I also come in, and they're bookmarked, these little pink marks that are out here. I have specific chapters that mean an awful lot to me that have meant something to me, and there's a passage that I might want to read, and I'm not going to read it to you now, but recognize that there are no guarantees. And there's a message in here about, you get people that say, hey, I've got it on my list, I think we can make something happen for you, in fact, I think I've got a job for you. There are no guarantees that you're actually unpacking the boxes. <laughs> it's the message that's here. And it's a short paragraph, and I read that, and I'll move on to the next one. And I set them up by saying, let me tell you how I'm going to set up my day. I give them the speech. I say I'm going to read a couple chapters that have some meaning to me. And then I do what I like to call chapter roulette. And it's a ton of fun because I have no idea what I'm going to read. So someone just yell out a page to me. There's a hundred and... Seventy pages. Seventy pages. Be realistic with promises. Even the best intentioned people make promises they can't keep. If I stopped looking for a job each time I was promised something, I would be years away from where I want to be. During a discussion at a local career center, I was once asked, what do you do while you're waiting for a company to get back to you? They, the company, said I would be two or three months. I hope my response wasn't too sharp when I said, and I quote, I would call my next lead. And then I would go on from there. And you have some fun with it because they have no idea what you're about to read. I have no idea what I'm about to read. But I'm proud of what's between the pages. And we have some fun with it. And you just have a certain time frame of when you do that. So maybe 10, 20 minutes of doing that. If your whole book reading is an hour, so I have 7 minutes of a speech, a little bit of an introduction, about 10 minutes of that. And 10 minutes of reading specific ones that I want. Or, or It doesn't have to be a chapter, it can be a paragraph. And then I do page roulette or chapter roulette. And then I go into a Q&A. When it comes to a Q&A, how do you deal with that? And I know we only have a couple minutes left. So I'm going to have to practice what I preach you. When it comes 
comes to a QA, one of the most important parts to think about the book signing or book reading. To allow enough time. What's that? To allow enough time. Allow enough time for it, absolutely. And maybe let them know earlier that there will be a QA. Great point. So they can gather up their questions for you and you can pay attention to it and you can leave enough room to answer the questions, but also leave enough room to sign your books. You have to make sure that you give some time for that. You have to account for it. If you have to be kicked out of the room after an hour, you have to make sure that you account for it in the Q&A. So you might preface it by saying, we'll do 10 minutes of Q&A. And then you can, you're set. Brooke, do you have a point?
Don't be afraid to take some chances with newspaper, with social media, with other means to promote it. Last question. Um, one uh, thing that, that I felt really worked was suggested to me by another author is uh, write out on some index cards some Q&A uh, questions and answers. And if, if your audience hasn't covered these, uh, flip the card up and uh, ask your own question and answer. Yeah, that's a great point. Answering your own questions so and you're prepared for it. Uh, and you keep the meeting moving. It's very important to learn to become a meeting facilitator while you're getting this book reading. And that just means keep it moving. There are a couple extra tabs I have noted in the book that when it got slow, when there are times it'll get slow, and maybe they're a little just shy about starting to be the first person to ask a question, you can do that. So I've gone to my own page roulette periodically. And I'll say, I'm going to go to page 97 now and read something. And, and then we'll say, talk about what I just said. Or, you know, what, how did that resonate with you? Or do you know anyone who has read something about a similar character? Or, and then you can go down that path. You can facilitate the conversation and ask the audience questions themselves. And I've said that to audiences. If you don't ask me questions, I'll ask them of you. And we've had some fun with it. And it's about engaging the audience because they're there to already see you. They're already there. So take advantage of what you have in front of you. And don't worry about keeping them here. Worry about engaging with them so when they walk out, they keep talking about that message. A great question. And I think we are in the wrap-up stage of this. Um, but I'll be glad to answer any other last questions or have a conversation at the table or stay in after and, and answer some questions. So thank you.